We've discussed how the wave function for the particle in the box was developed and how it's used. We'll now see how this process is extended to a hydrogen atom. In this video, we'll cover three basic concepts. First, is reviewing what the Bohr model is and when it's okay to use it. We'll very quickly be transitioning away from it. We'll discuss the historical development of the equations used to find the energy level in the hydrogen atom. So this will be the Schrodinger equation and the Rydberg equation. And we'll do a semi sort of derivation of the Rydberg equation, which was initially found experimentally. And we're going to do that a little bit differently. We're going to actually use the information from the Schrodinger equation um, to derive the Rydberg equation. Bohr modeled electrons as orbiting the nucleus at defined intervals. This is called quantized energy levels. This is normally talked about as a historical model because it really only works uh, for one electron atoms and ions. However, using it to help us gain understanding about the simplest cases will help us in understanding how more complex cases work, even if we never actually do the math. Let's add in some more details about the energy levels. We can calculate the energy of each energy level using this equation. The RH stands for the Rydberg constant, the Z for the atomic number, which in hydrogen's case is one, and then the N value being each energy level that we're trying to calculate. Let's talk about how this was discovered. It was actually discovered twice in two different ways, and these two ways agree. The Rydberg equation was developed experimentally by analyzing patterns of light that were emitted after electrons were excited. So they would come back down and they could look at those patterns of light. By carefully comparing different spectra, the, the Rydberg equation and the different energy levels could be determined. The Schrodinger equation was developed very differently. Schrodinger worked through the quantum theory similarly to what we talked about doing for the particle in the box. This led to the derivation of the energy levels in the hydrogen atom. For hydrogen and for one electron ions, this can be done exactly. Though for anything with more electrons, different approximations are necessary. Either method yields the same result. Schrodinger's is just a bit more detailed, where instead of just a single constant RH, it now has a series of constants that tells you a bit more detail about where that number comes from. Think back to the process I showed you for deriving the energy levels for the particle in the box. You could maybe take this moment to go review the video if you'd like. The same process can be used for a hydrogen atom, though it's significantly more complicated. And once again, this requires differential equations. The process is well beyond the scope of the class, but if you take physical chemistry, you'll do this. I have included a link here um, if you're interested enough to want to learn more, but not within the scope of the class. But here's what is. Here, the results derived from the Schrodinger equation is listed for you. The energy value consists of these different constants, where Z is the atomic number, H is Planck's constant, N is the energy level. Those should all be familiar to you. The capital R is made up of the different constants shown here. We have the mass of the electron, the permittivity of free space, and the atomic radius. These were all determined theoretically, but we'll see shortly that it also agrees with the experiments. The process for determining this equation isn't something that you'd be tested on in my class. Knowing that it was determined theoretically and exactly using quantum mechanics is enough without needing the details. And you absolutely would never be tested on those individual details um, contained within this link here. It's just purely if you're interested in learning more. Now, let's move on to the Rydberg equation. I want to introduce us to an analogy first. We can think of these energy levels as steps. The ball can transition from one step to another, and it can skip steps but it always needs to be on a step. It can't rest in between those two steps. 
Now, it's not a perfect analogy. Nothing in quantum mechanics really is. Um, as the ball does in fact travel between steps in this analogy, whereas in an electron situation, it doesn't. It just goes from one to the other without ever traveling in between. But this idea can help us understand the math and logic when we get to talking about the spectroscopy. Now, a step between one and five is gonna require more energy than a step between three and five. It's more work to go up four stairs than it is two. Or if that's not a big enough difference for you, it's more work to go up four flights of stairs than two. Now, I also wanna point out one little thing in my analogy. Notice this is kind of a silly staircase. The steps get smaller as you go up them. This would obviously not be how you'd build a real staircase, but I wanted to do this even in the analogy because this simulates how the energy levels in a hydrogen atom do get closer and closer together as you move up. The Rydberg equation was determined by looking at the hydrogen line spectra and fitting the wavelength of the lines to the spacing of the atoms. It was determined before the quantum mechanics for the Schrodinger equation were developed. And so they didn't really know what that constant out front was, that RH, just that it was there and that it must be there to make the experiment work. This is the version of the equation that was developed initially. And because it was developed looking at the wavelengths, it has particular characteristics. One of which being it, of course, lists this based on one over lambda. For a variety of reasons, the professors here at UCI don't tend to use this version. We find that students do a bit better when connecting um, these concepts with energy, since we can more easily see why this equation exists using the energy, and then after doing that, relate that to the wavelength. Let's take another look at the equation we have for the energy levels. This is the simplified version of the result we have from the Schrodinger equation, as there's really no reason to have to type in so many constants. We can just use our age. If we want to know the change in energy between two energy levels, we find it the way we find a change in basically any sort of energy, final minus initial. I want us to use these concepts to derive the Rydberg equation from the basic idea that a change in energy is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy. Now, we can take our energy equation for each individual energy level and fill it in to our final minus initial. You can see this is pretty messy and really unnecessarily so. Let's clean it up by pulling out the constants and cleaning up the negative signs. We can clean up the negative signs in two different ways. The first is by pulling out the negative sign completely from the parentheses, but leaving it out front. The second is by rearranging the terms in the equation to remove it completely. These will both be published depending on what book, homework program, or other resource you're using. And they are the exact same equation, okay? Exact same equation. Students will often create all sorts of crazy ideas about when to use one versus the other. But in reality, they're the exact same equation. They're just written differently. The algebra is just slightly different. In the second one, the negative sign is distributed into the parentheses and then the two terms are flipped. But it is the same equation. The exams in my class will give you this one. That's the one that the department has decided on. And so that's the one that I'm gonna be using when solving problems. And I would also suggest that it be the one that you're using when you solve problems so that you don't accidentally mix something up. Let's do an example where the electron transitions between the n equals two and n equals five state. This is a two-step problem that is walking you through both steps first solving for the energy and then using that energy to solve for the wavelength. Keep in mind, most homework and exam problems aren't going to do that for you. And instead, you'll need to know that to get to the wavelength, you should go through the energy first. When we use the version of the Rydberg equation, 
that has energy, we need to match the units by using the RH in joules. You can find that in the book, the internet, or probably your best bet is actually to keep the uh, formula sheet for the exam on hand. That way you'll know exactly where to find it on the day of the exam. We fill in our Rydberg. We fill in one for Z because it's a hydrogen atom. And then we're going between the n equals two and n equals five state. So our NF is five, our Ni is two. We plug that in and we get our final delta E. Now let's think about this next step. Um, I'm asking you to change delta E to wavelength. Let's consider why this is possible before jumping into this problem. Energy must be conserved. So if an electron loses a particular amount of energy or gains a particular amount of energy, then that energy must be conserved by that photon that is either absorbed or released. So the difference in energy must be equal to the magnitude of the photon that is absorbed or released. And we know from our earlier discussions that the energy of the photon is equal to hc over lambda or h nu. So if we know the frequency or the wavelength, we can calculate the delta e. And if we know the delta e, then we can calculate the wavelength or the frequency. So let's go back to our problem. Now we can move on to finding the wavelength. We know the magnitude of dE here is equal to the energy of the photon. And that, the energy of the photon, is related to its wavelength by hc over lambda. We can rearrange the equation to get our unknown alone. Remember to view my prereq videos if you need any help with this type of algebra. On the NAC website, I put uh, up videos to help you with this kind of algebra. From here, we can fill in our constants and energy and get our wavelength. Because all of our units cancel to be m, this will give our, because all of our units cancel to be meters, this will be given in meters. Very, very often these problems will also ask you to convert into another unit like nanometers. Always be sure at the end of the questions you ask yourself, is this in the right unit? Canvas is completely and utterly unforgiving of such mistakes, so you must always make sure your units are right. I have one more example, well, actually two examples, that I want us to work on. These will require care and attention to the signs that we are using. So before we go into that, let's explicitly state the conventions and rules for signs in our discussion of the hydrogen atom. A free electron has an energy of zero. It's not actually a fact that comes up all that much. Energy levels all have a negative value. This means that the lowest possible energy level is n equals one, and the highest, um, or the higher the n, the higher the energy. Because of this, whenever an electron goes from a low energy to a high energy, like for instance, n equals one to n equals four, it will be increasing in energy and its energy change will be positive. Similarly, when an electron loses energy, it will be going from a high energy down to a low energy. So something like n equals four down to n equals one would be losing energy. That losing of energy means its change in energy is negative. Often the question will tell you if an electron is going up or down in energy, not via the numbers, but rather through the language that is used. If a photon is absorbed, that means that the electron is absorbing the energy of the photon, which means it must be going up in energy, leading to a positive d. If a photon is emitted, then the electron is losing energy, and that means that the delta E is going to be negative. Now let's do two different problems that in many ways are very, very similar. They're picked for their similarities. In one case, if you pay no attention to the signs, you'll wind up getting it right. And you might be misled into thinking that your thinking is also correct. But in another, if you ignore the signs, you're going to get it incorrect. Um, and hopefully this will bring attention to this and help solve some problems that tend to come up in this chapter. So carefully notice the similarities and differences. Take a moment and read these. If you need more time than I give you, 
uh, please go ahead and pause it so that you can read through both problems before we get started. The problem tells us that the electron absorbs a photon. This means that the electron is increasing in energy. Just like if your bank account absorbs money, it's increasing in the amount and the change is positive. This means that the delta E will be positive. However, we can't go directly to filling into the Rydberg equation because we don't have E. We must first find it by recognizing that the delta E magnitude and the magnitude of the photon's energy are the same. And we know that the energy of the photon is equal to h nu, and we have the frequency. So we can now fill all of our numbers in and solve for e. We can fill in our frequency to here. We know our h, and we can fill that into here. We will then get the energy of the photon, which is equal to the delta e, and we can fill it in. Notice here that h nu comes out positive, and we also know that dE must be positive. So now we can fill this into the Rydberg equation and solve for n. If you are having trouble with this algebra, remember to check out my prereq videos for help with the algebraic equations. I actually use this as an example of how to solve it. Now, if you had not paid attention and you hadn't noticed that this was positive and that DE needed to be positive, you would have just filled it in and you would have gotten this one right. And you might think, oh, okay, I know the concept. Even if you hadn't paid attention to that, that signs, this next one isn't going to let you slide there. So let's move on and do our second one. Take another moment, pause if you need to, and see if you can think about the differences and how this is going to affect our problem solving. As another hint in addition to my last slide, remember, we are thinking carefully about the signs. Pause the video now and take as much time as you need. I would suggest trying to start the problem on your own and working through it as far as possible and then come back and watch me solve it and see if you got it right or see if you made the mistake that is sort of built into this or the trap that is sort of built into this. We'll start out identically. Recognizing this as a Rydberg equation problem, remembering that the energy of the photon um, is equal in magnitude to the change in energy, and knowing that the energy of the photon is equal to h nu. Now, notice the careful language I've been using. The magnitude of the delta E is equal to the photon's energy. However, the sign might be the opposite. In this case, the problem says that a photon is emitted. This means that delta E must be negative. Yet, the photon's energy will always be positive. So when we do this step of filling the energy of the photon into the Rydberg equation, we have to notice that the delta E is negative and put the negative sign in there ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to get the incorrect answer. And then we can solve for Ni. This is by far the most frequent mistake made on these problems and the mistake that people make and then they can't seem to find where that mistake is because the math has all done correctly. So always, 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 always make a note when doing these sorts of problems to think about the sign of DE. This has been an action packed video. I know it's a bit longer than most, um, but students tend to have a lot of problem with the problem solving in this section. So I wanted to do lots of sample problems. And of course, we'll do more of these in class as well.